Hi, I'm Valentina, an associate in our corporate and commercial team. This is another episode from the series Boardroom Conversations. And today I'm joined by Rob. Rob, can you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Rob Watson. I'm a senior associate in the corporate team here at Collie Bristow. Thanks, Rob. Following previous discussions regarding directors' duties and decision-making, Today, Rob and I will be talking about how conflicts of interest for directors can be identified and the ways in which they can be resolved. The duty to declare conflicts of interest in the company's transactions should be a constant consideration for board members, as it is one of the seven general duties imposed on directors under the Companies Act 2006. So what are conflicts and how can they arise? Yeah, that's a great question to start us off, uh, Valentina. And what is a director's conflict? Um, it is where the director's personal interests or someone or the interests of someone else the director owes a duty to conflict with the duties they owe to the company. So three of the general duties applicable to directors that are covered by this area is, is their duty to avoid conflicts of interest, their duty not to accept benefits from third parties, and also their duty to declare interests in a proposed or existing transaction or arrangement. So we're looking at quite a broad spectrum of areas, but the crux of it being try to avoid having two competing interests running against each other. Um, The Companies Act 2006 sets out three main types of conflict situations. And maybe that's something you could summarise for us, Valentina. Sure. One of the examples is where a director is interested in a proposed transaction or an arrangement with a company. For example, a director of company A is also a shareholder in company B, and the board of company A are proposing to enter into a supply agreement with company B. Another type of conflict situations is where a director is interested in an existing transaction or an arrangement with a company. For example, a director of company C is married to a director of company D, a key supplier of company C. And finally, the third example is where a director has a conflict of interest other than in relation to a transaction or an arrangement with a company. For example, a director of company E holds shares in a major competitor of that company. Thank you. I mean, those are all quite good examples of, of how these situations can arise, all fairly naturally in the, the work of being a company director. But outside of the examples given, holding multiple roles within a business, such as being a director, shareholder and employee simultaneously, can make it difficult to reconcile the obligations of each role with each other. Directors have to be especially careful when considering decisions that will financially benefit them as an employee or a shareholder, but not necessarily be in the best interest of the company or in their role as director. Thanks, Rob. This is a useful summary. Conflicts of interest can be fairly innocent, such as the owner of a small business approving the sale of their own shares, through to less honest situations, such as signing a contract with a new supplier due to a gift or an incentive being provided to the director personally by that new supplier. Absolutely. There's a fairly broad spectrum there between the honesty of those situations, but the important point is that the nature of that conflict is irrelevant, only that the conflict has to be declared to the other directors, which leads us into then how you avoid or resolve those conflicts. So we've we've touched on some elements of this already. However, there's different ways that the duty to declare could be avoided, but also how it can be that conflict of interest itself could be resolved. From the position of trying to avoid that duty to declare, first and foremost, it's subject to awareness. If the director doesn't know why that conflict might have arisen, then they can't be aware of conflict that they need to declare. Similarly, if a conflict has been declared previously, a historic declaration made, there's no need to declare it again and again each time it comes up in the same scenario. Also, where that interest cannot reasonably be regarded as giving rise to a conflict, obviously there's going to be no need to make a declaration. There's also no need to disclose your interest in your own service contract. That's going to be a constant area of knowledge for the directors involved. They know the director has a service contract with the business. It's not going to be a conflict situation. And in terms of then resolving a conflict that has been declared, there's the clear option, which is that the members or the shareholders authorise that conflict, whether formally by resolution or informally, just by unanimous agreement. 
but also compliance with any procedure set out in the Articles of Association, which can vary from company to company. Just to add that it is important to be aware not only of existing, but also of potential conflicts to ensure they're handled properly, particularly where there are tight margins in board votes or a breakdown in shareholder relations. Absolutely, because in both those situations, you can have people trying to tread over old ground and find reasons why decisions can be undermined or rescinded, which this certainly leads us on to the, how the consequences of what happens if that conflict is not resolved or it's not declared in the first place. And there are some some of the more internal solutions might be a rescission of the contract that was related to that conflict of interest. So if it hasn't yet been performed, the company could pull out of that agreement because it was entered into improperly. Um, it could also be a situation where that director has therefore breached their fiduciary duty to the company and a civil claim could be brought against that director by the company itself. And also, it could simply be a breach of the director's service agreement or their employment contract, which obviously would have solutions set out in that agreement in terms of potential suspension or termination of that contract. But those are probably some of the more internal solutions. Valentina, could you touch on some of the more serious resolutions? Yes, some more serious consequences could be a claim for a misrepresentation of fraud offences in more serious cases. Finally, there could be a third-party action, for example, an action brought by regulators such as the FCA, if the company falls within their jurisdiction, or even a disqualification action brought by the Department for Business and Trade. Both of which would be fairly serious matters and hold consequences for directors' position with other companies as well if they held directorships elsewhere and were now restricted from standing as a director or restricted from being a regulated person, perhaps under an FCA regulated company. Finally, there's also the potential for unfair prejudice action. So in certain circumstances, it might be that that conflict of interest has been brought about by a director that's in some way prejudiced the position of the mi a minority shareholder or a group of minority shareholders, in which case they could look to try and bring an action against that director through the company. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. And keep an eye out for future updates where we'll be covering other topics in this area, which we hope you'll find useful in terms of running or advising a company.